Hello and welcome to the Armenian News Network, Grung. I'm Aspet Bedrosian, and we're recording this episode on Saturday, November 12, 2022. Today, Hovik Manucharian and I will be talking about an initiative in the diaspora called Hi ID, which is in the process of registering Armenians around the world by issuing Armenian identity cards in order to hold democratic elections in all diaspora communities to elect delegates to a diaspora Armenian parliament. Let me read from Hi ID's website about what it says it is. The principal purpose and objective of the nonprofit and nonpartisan high ID organization is to unify Armenians around a common platform, integrate the collective economic, cultural, and political power of the Armenian nation in order to express their views and organize the Diaspora Armenian Parliament, DAP for short, through transparent democratic elections. So to talk about this, we are joined by Harut Sasunyan, who is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of High ID. He is also the publisher of the California Courier newspaper and the president of the Armenia Artsakh Fund, a nonprofit organization which has delivered over $947 million of humanitarian assistance to Armenia and Artsakh since 1989. Thanks for joining us, Harut. My pleasure. Hello, Harut. Harut, in your own words, what is the purpose of High ID and what's the purpose of issuing High ID cards? Well, let me start with the context. We have a Republic of Armenia, for better or worse, with a government, a parliament, ministers, etc. And we have a Republic of Artsakh in pretty bad shape, but still there, Mm -hmm. at least parts of it. But outside of those two entities in the diaspora around the world, we have no entity that unifies all 7 million diaspora Armenians in one platform. And... We have millions of people, thousands of organizations. No one communicates with anyone else. Uh, Everybody tries to solve their own local problems. So we thought it's uh, way past time to uh, try to create a common platform to bring as many of the 7 million as possible and unify them in one platform and try to solve our common problems collectively rather than piecemeal. So that's the whole purpose of trying to form uh, and elect a diaspora army in parliament through democratic elections, because we don't believe in the fact that uh, anybody can say, I'm the leader of such and such community, self-appointed leaders are not acceptable, and we don't want anybody else to appoint leaders for us. I think it's the Armenian people in general have to cast out their own vote, one vote per person, And by majority uh, election, they decide who represents that particular community. And if all these representatives come together, they form the diaspora army in parliament. And the parliament will deal with all sorts of issues that we have, whether they're local, national, international, in terms of working with the government of Armenia and Artsakh, trying to solve uh, pan-Armenian issues, We're not going to get involved in running uh, issues within Armenia, Republic of Armenia. That's their issue. But we can sit together and discuss how to solve major pan-Armenian issues together. Because what the government can do is different than what the diaspora can do as a community is different. But if we get together, put our heads together and do a division of labor, we can solve different aspects of the problem that each one cannot solve on its own. Harut, if I may interject, my mind uh, is basically wandering into different areas that, you know, I, I've always said to myself that if the diaspora was only more united, they could do X and they could do Y. But can you give examples of the types of problems that you see that uh, this diaspora parliament could solve that aren't being solved today? Something tangible that you think that it is a good opportunity for this organization to exist? Well, as I said, all of the existing problems that we have had for a long time, each community has tried to solve it on its own, each individual on their own. But there has not been a collective effort to come together and learn from uh, each other's experiences, what works and what doesn't work. If if there's a problem in Glendale, there's a similar problem in, in Sydney, Australia, for example. But... The people in Glendale have no idea how the Armenians in Sydney are trying to solve their problem. And if they've come up with a solution, it's not known to us. So each one of us, we're starting from scratch, 
trying to reinvent the wheel and trying to struggle through uh, problems. But if you come together, we learn from each other's experience and see what is a successful model that has been accomplished elsewhere. So it's not that we're going to solve new problems. We're going to have a new approach to solve existing problems, whether it's the preservation of the of the language, the culture, uh, the high tat, the Armenian cause, schools, churches, you name it. it, it it's an all-encompassing, whatever issues there are that of importance to the diaspora communities, the diaspora Armenia will, will deal with that, plus coordinate their efforts with the leadership in Armenia and Artsakh. To add an example, when the Syrian-Armenian community was suffering during the war in Syria, Armenians organized some help, like the Syrian-Armenian Relief Fund effort, but there was not a worldwide Armenian response. Harut, of course, when you are talking about elections and votes and things like that, you have to kind of identify who is going to be able to vote. How are you going to keep tabs on 7 million Armenians strewn around the world? Well, as in every election uh, in uh, every country in the world, before anybody casts a vote, they first have to register so that registration identifies who they are and if they're qualified to, to cast a vote. So similarly with uh, high ID, uh, Armenians and diaspora first have to register. And diaspora Armenians are all those who are presently living in the diaspora, at least most of the time of the year. So we're not going to look at their uh, whether they're legally in, in X, Y, Z country or, or illegally there, whether they're tourists uh, there for a long time or not. If they live, if they have an address in diaspora, they qualify to cast their vote. But how do you tell if somebody tries to go to your website and register? How do you know that these people are Armenian? How do you make sure that they don't register 10 times or whatever? Well, the the second part is easy. Uh, they can't register 10 times because each time they register, we give them a, a particular ID number. And if they use the same address, same name, we don't give them a second uh, ID number. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, we, we are concerned very much in people pretending to be someone else or non-Armenians trying to uh, come in and vote. That's why any anytime we have a question about somebody, we try to uh, find people who know them to vouch for them that they are Armenians, that they are who they say they are, that they live where, where they live. That there are also some websites that you pay a small amount of money. It identifies uh, addresses, whether the, such an address exists or it's a fake address anywhere in the world. They, they do that for you. But uh, it, it's an issue that... The, the the only thing that we need to worry about is, for example, uh, the most simple example is millions of Turks trying to register to vote in Armenian diaspora elections. Mm -hmm. I doubt that's going to happen, but it's always good to prevent it, predict it, and try to take measures to prevent it. And we're not there yet. We're still at the initial steps. We haven't come across anybody pretending to be somebody else uh, yet, but if we do... We'll, we're going to look into it and try to verify the person's background and location. Can you talk a little bit about how you're going to hold an election? Let's say we have all these Armenians in Glendale. There's a bunch of Armenians in Argentina, some in Syria, some in you know Kenya. How are we all going to vote on something? Okay, well, uh, for, first they have to be registered. Once, they're, once we have their registration, we issue them a number, a, a unique number, Mm -hmm. And then we issue them a, a high ID card, so which translates into registration to vote. Mm -hmm. So once we have a list of all the people who are registered to vote, then they can cast on their computers through internet their vote, and then it gets tabulated uh, no matter where they are in, in, in the world. And they elect their delegates or representatives of their own region. If there's a lot of Armenians in a particular country or a particular city, then they qualify to have multiple representatives. But if a country like Kenya, you said, for example, probably uh, all of Africa will have one delegate if there are collectively about 25,000 or so uh, Armenians in that region, entire region. So we don't have a delegate per country. It's almost like uh, those who are familiar with the congressional election, 
it's, it's not regional. It's uh, how many people live in a particular area. So it's the, by population size. Population size. So the number of voters in each of the districts will be the same number. But uh, some regions will, will have, let's say, Glendale will have several districts because of the large Armenian population. Mm-hmm. But there will be several countries in Africa or several countries in Asia combined to have, for example, 25,000 people. So, Harut, uh, if we're going to have representation across the diaspora, one question that comes to mind is, is there going to be some form of taxation that gets raised as part of the project? We have a plan of how to uh, be able to fund this uh, initiative. It's a little bit unusual. The normal way is to ask for either donations or a membership fees. We, we've avoided both of these options. We have a third option. Initially, for someone to register, we just asked them to pay one time, lifetime, $15 in order for them to register, and then we print a, a actual card with their photo on it and we mail it to them. So mm-hmm. basically that's the cost of the card and, and the mailing cost. But there's a little bit of money left for us, but that's not enough to run anything with that kind of money. But the bulk of the money, uh, here's our plan. The high ID card is not only a card to register, which it is, but also it's a way of getting discounts from various businesses around the world, whether they're restaurants, hotels, airlines, uh, shopping centers, shops, etc., et or services people pay. Mm-hmm. We haven't done much yet. We've started, but when we get to it, we will be able to make agreements, sign agreements with various businesses around the world. And it's like, uh, you know, Costco membership. They have a card, you come in, you buy things at a, at a discount, and or, or like Amazon, where if your uh, charity is registered, Amazon gives half of a percent back to the charity without charging you more from their own profits. So once we register those businesses in the high ID network, then the cardholder, when he goes to one of those uh, shopping centers and buys anything, there's a prearranged agreement with with the business owner of what percent discount they're willing to give. Let's let's say just a general number, 10 percent discount. Of the 10% discount, 5% goes to the shopper and 5% would go to the high ID organization. Now, 5% sounds like very little money, but if we have, not even if we don't have millions, but even if we have hundreds of thousands of cardholders and they shop all the time, they buy things, they pay for services, and if 5% comes to the organization, that can really translate into millions and millions of dollars every year of revenue without really doing anything, any fundraising or taxing people or having people pay every year a certain amount. So we'll we'll see whether we're able to do this. If we are, then it's it's a way of solving our financial problem. This is very important because if this is going to be a parliament that's going to represent communities and be capable of any action, then it's going to need a budget in order to fund prioritized projects. Without a budget, they'd be a talk shop, but they can't do anything. Well, the, the the revenue that will come through the high ID discount cards will will pay to the following things. One, for the operations of the high ID organization with the staff that will manage all these different activities, collecting members and registering them and uh, uh, overseeing any issues that come up. And uh, so the high ID expense is one thing. The second thing is, as you mentioned, the expense of the parliament, of running a parliament, having a parliament. It won't be a parliament the way we're thinking of in terms of a, a building that people have to sit in. You know, it could be a parliament via Zoom or Skype. Mm-hmm. And then and then if they want to, it's up to the parliament members when, when they uh, come to exist, whether they want to come together once or twice a year uh, someplace, either in Yerevan or in uh, a major diaspora capital, and face-to-face meeting can also take place. So the high ID discount will also pay the expenses for the running of the parliament. The third area that the money will go for, as we have many, many projects and needs, both in Armenia and diaspora, if we get a substantial amount of income from this uh, discounts, uh, the parliament can authorized by a majority vote to fund various projects in Armenia and diaspora. Let's say if a particular community needs a school, 
to be built. The money can be allocated by the parliament to build that school. Or if there are housing needed in Armenia or someplace else or refugees or newcomers or immigrants to Armenia, they can allocate money for housing or for whatever the needs are. Will it have an oversight branch or an executive branch to oversee the projects? Yes, the, there will be an audit committee that will like a control committee that will uh, oversee the expenditure of the money and the accounting of the organization will be made public. The High ID is a registered nonprofit 501c3 organization in California. So already by US laws, we're obligated to have our operations audited and our financial activities will be made public. So anybody can see where the money has gone, what we've spent on, because nonprofits' financial statements are, are public statements. It's available through IRS, it's available through, through right. others like GuideStar and things like this. So what steps have you taken so far to disseminate this idea throughout the diaspora? Well, so far, what we've done is we've issued a, a few press releases to inform the Armenian community worldwide about this uh, initiative. We have also given tons of interviews, just like we're giving one now, on various Armenian TV stations, Armenian newspapers in Armenia and the diaspora. And we have passed the word of mouth through our own circle of friends, contacts. The basic network of the uh, high ID in the diaspora will be by establishing branches initially in each of the communities. So we have one branch in Glendale already functioning for the couple of years and then one branch in Tahanga. We also have a branch in Yerevan. The only difference between high ID members in Armenia and the ones in diaspora, two separate things. One is in terms of discount, the cardholders in Armenia will also be, be able to get a discount from businesses in Armenia when they shop. But they will not be able to vote in terms of electing diaspora representatives because people in Armenia have already their own parliament that they vote for. It's not going to be fair and right to have Ar Armenian citizens in Armenia voting who's going to represent a particular community diaspora. That's the job of the diaspora Armenians. So we, we get to vote in the diaspora and get discounts. Uh, the members in Armenia get the discounts, but do not vote. But if there are general surveys, referendum, things like this, that we send to everybody, they can participate so that we can get to know what they're thinking about a particular issue. They agree, disagree, whatever. So we we'll just get an idea about their uh, positions. There are so many questions that come up from the technical. You know, for instance, what do you do when someone is, lives in Armenia but is a dual citizen of the U.S. and Armenia? There are a lot of minutia that I don't want to get into, but also... I think ideological. Where do you divide, you know, draw the line between the interests of the state that an individual lives in uh, versus uh, the parliament, and how will each, you know, this be organized in each different country? But Harut, I remember you, uh, you know, responding to us. It was probably on a, in a previous interview, either to us or to a different media, where you said basically this is not a simple problem, and I agree with that. And I think that's sort of, you know. Uh, if, if this was a simple problem, it would have been solved many years ago. So I think it's good to just sort of start thinking about this, if not just start somewhere and see where it takes us. But I wanted to ask, because I haven't thought about this, but is there an example of an organization that you're choosing to model? Or, you know, what is the closest diaspora organization out there, maybe in the uh, Jewish diaspora or some other diaspora, that we can look at and say, okay, well, we can take some things from, from this organization as a start, or maybe we shouldn't emulate these other aspects of this or other organization. Have you any examples for us? Okay, I, I think you've asked three separate questions, some very uh, short. Uh, I'll answer all three of them. If somebody's a dual citizen, we go by their address. If they live most of the year in the diaspora, then they can vote to their diasporans. If they live in Armenia, then they, they cannot vote. So that's a simple thing. The second thing, uh, before we come to the models in diaspora... Uh, yeah. Interests interest of the countries versus... Like, yeah. Uh, basically, well, yeah, it, it, that, that is a very sensitive issue because in democratic countries in the West, uh, there's no problem. Uh, people can give their opinion, they, they can get together and uh, discuss issues, even take decisions. Uh, that's not a problem. Let's starting with the State Republic of Armenia. I don't think there'll be a problem with Armenia because... 
we're not going to interfere in their domestic uh, local issues. That's up to them. But in terms of pan-Armenian issues, we have to sit down with them. We give our opinion. Of course, they're the government in Armenia. We cannot overrule the government, but we can express our opinion. The parliament, by majority vote, will discuss all sorts of pan-Armenian issues like genocide, Western Armenia, Artsakh. And then, uh, of course, we, we're not a government. Uh, we cannot enforce our decisions. But if you have millions of members in diaspora, and, and the, the representatives of the diaspora have a particular uh, position on an issue based on millions of votes, that's going to count a lot even to someone sitting in Armenia, Armenian leadership. They're not going to easily dismiss the opinions of millions of uh, Armenians in diaspora. Ultimately, the final decision is left to them, but we're going to have our input, uh, our say. In other countries outside of Armenia, in some countries that are very controlling type countries, and I only want to name one and not name others, not to turn off already certain countries against us. But for example, the Turkish government is extremely sensitive on political activity by Armenians living in Turkey. Mm -hmm. And those who live there, they know that it's sensitive. They're very cautious in what they do. So they uh, we have to be very sensitive about that. And uh, the Either at the end, the Turkish government is going to ban their citizens to be a, a member of the parliament, mm -hmm. or, or they may even not allow to have elections in Istanbul or other places to select their delegates. The only flexibility we have, if in a particular country like Turkey or a couple of other countries, if the government is very touchy and they're not about to allow their own citizens living in their country to vote for a supra structure at the diaspora parliament, then if they have already local community representatives that they have already elected on their own, independently of us, through some measure which may be different from the way we go about the elections, then we have no choice but to accept the representatives of the community. I think there, there are some, such elections in Istanbul. There are such elections in Cyprus, I recently learned. And there are such elections, I think, in Iran. And uh, do you mean within the community, the Armenian community yeah, with, yeah, in these the countries? Armenian community in, in those countries, they, they've already have selected their representatives. I think there may be also some in Hungary. But if there are such countries where they don't allow us to elect our own, we will just accept their own elected delegates, even if they're different uh, on based on different criteria from us. Mm -hmm. And the more sensitive part of this is not just that, is going beyond that. If, for example, the diaspora parliament meets and it takes a position on something done by the government of Turkey, whether they're in genocide or Western Armenia or something happening today in terms of elections for the patriarch or some other issue, controversy with the government. And if the Armenian parliament, the diaspora parliament takes a position, that's going to upset the Turkish government against us. And that, that may have some repercussions on the delegates within Turkey, no matter how they're elected, their participation within the, uh, the diaspora parliament. So I don't have all the answers yet for this very touchy, sensitive issues. But when the parliament is elected, and if there's participation from Turkey and some other countries in that initial meeting, they will listen to their concerns and see how they can accommodate them and try to see if there's a solution to, the, to those uh, sensitive problems. Uh, there may be some, I don't, I don't know, because I, I cannot speak for the parliament. Uh, I don't represent anybody except myself. The parliament, by majority, decides what to do, what position to take. And if the parliament cannot find a solution, then we probably, regrettably, have to work without delegates from this couple of countries, which would be not a good option, but if we're forced to do it, then that's 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 how we're going to end up. Harut, how many people are in this parliament? Is there any kind of a census that you are relying on or hoping that will be organized to count the number of Armenians in the diaspora? Well, what we've decided initially is it doesn't make sense to have elections with very few cardholders, very few members. Yeah. If we have up to 150,000 diaspora Armenians scattered in uh, 10 or 15 different countries, not all of them in one country because it's a diaspora parliament, not parliament of one country. Then we can have the our first election with 150,000 
registered members, cardholders. And then that will be the initial parliament. And then as we grow to, God willing, 300,000, 500,000 million or more, then there'll be a second election four years later with much larger participation. So because the more members we have, the more we can claim to be representative of the communities that they come from. If they're just a handful of people, we already have now a similar situation where a handful of people are members of existing organizations. And uh, the problem is that they cannot claim to represent their community. They only represent their own organization. So if we want to be different and claim that we represent the majority of the community, then we need to have a lot of people in, in each of the communities who join us. But is there a census that you can rely on? Well, as we all know, there are a lot of general numbers. For example, if someone goes to Wikipedia, it breaks down in each of the countries how many Armenians. Mm -hmm. Of course, even Wikipedia's numbers are just guesstimates, they were estimates that no, no one knows for sure. No one has really counted. The only official census there is, it's, it's in Armenia. And outside of Armenia, even that number of people dispute what's done by government and official numbers. In the diaspora, I'm not aware of any census. Organizations know how many members they have in their own organization, or the church knows how many registered church uh, members there are. But in each of the community, no one has done the work. If we grow large enough, yes, uh, and we represent a substantial portion of the community, then we can also engage in uh, taking a census, which will give us a quite accurate numbers, maybe not 100%, but almost 100%. So that we have no census. We have estimates. So we talk about one and a half million in the uh, United States. Some people give a little more or a little less numbers. We're all guessing because the, the U.S. has an official governmental census. But if you look at the census numbers, there's only couple of hundred thousand Armenians in the census, that's because unless you write in in the census that you're an Armenian, then you don't count as an Armenian. Uh, you write Caucasian or white or whatever, you don't show that you're Armenian. Right. People uh, estimate that are in France that are anywhere from 400,000 to 500,000 Armenians. The numbers in the Middle East have lessened quite a bit in the, during the recent conflicts in Lebanon, Syria, and Iraq. There are very few in Egypt. In Iran, a lot of the Iran army has left Iran. Most of them are either in Glendale or someplace else in Armenia. So those numbers are all estimates, and it doesn't interfere in what we're trying to do. But the better numbers we have, the better the project looks uh, reliable and, and trustworthy. Yeah, I think this is a big project to eventually have a census of the diaspora. Yeah. Harut, uh, thanks for the answer so far. If I may just remind you uh, of my third question, which is, you know, what examples are there of, you know, organizations that we may try to emulate or we may try to learn from? Okay, that's a very good question. We have looked at other examples of countries that have large diasporas, for example, Lebanon, Greece, France, Italy, surprisingly, Portugal. And uh, Israel, of course, they have various ways of dealing with diaspora representatives. Uh, some of them have organizations that uh, have representatives that work with the, their diaspora minister, for example, in, in Greece. Other countries like uh, France, they have elections in every French community in the diaspora. The French citizens that are registered with the consulate or the embassy of France in their country, every three or four years, they, they go and vote and, and select a delegate from their community. And those delegates go and sit in the uh, French parliament. They call overseas representatives. And there aren't that many of them. You know, They're not more than the local uh, parliament members or the Senate members. They're a small number. Portugal has a similar uh, arrangement. Italy has, uh, Greece has. In some countries, the organizations work with the diaspora minister of, of let's say, Greece, and uh, they do projects, they arrange things, they they help teaching of Greek to uh, Greeks in overseas. They invite them to come to Greece once a year to meet with the government officials and discuss their uh, issues. We haven't come across any example that does exactly what we do. Ours is... 100% through elections throughout the diaspora, 
one man, one vote, and the delegates that can number anywhere from 250 to 350 worldwide, they meet and discuss and decide things, either physically or by, by uh, uh, internet, Zoom or Skype. So we haven't come across anything. We've looked at other examples so we can learn from their experience. We've contacted, we've talked to them. But at the end of the day, we, we haven't copied anybody because we have a unique plan. The previous question we were discussing is also interesting to me because I think in terms of getting participation from different diasporas, I think participation will vary greatly based on uh, the acceptance from the existing community structures and organizations. So I wanted to ask if you've had any discussions with major, whether it's political parties or community organizations, uh, and whether we could get them to sort of back your idea as a way to jumpstart participation and, and jumpstart the organization itself. Yeah, that's a very important uh, point that you're asking about. I have personally uh, met with, when I was in Lebanon, met with representatives of all of the Lebanese Armenian organizations, including the political parties. And I, I spoke to all of them there and gave them a chance to ask their questions. They, you know, Lebanon is very highly uh, organized community centered uh, uh, on uh, a few major organizations. So I, I knew it would be a difficult uh, challenge to to present a, a different type of a organizational uh, formula to the Lebanese community. So initially, when the meeting started, they were very reluctant to consider any other uh, option. But I basically asked them before I went further, I said, are you satisfied with the situation of Armenians in the diaspora in Lebanon, for example? Are we moving forward or we're losing community members to simulation and we're we're going backwards. They said, no, we're not happy with our situation. I said, well, if you're not happy, then we all have to pull our heads together and come up with a solution to see how we can make progress and uh, preserve our uh, heritage, our language, etc. So I said, I'm not here to push on you a particular uh, type of project. If you have your own suggestion of how we can organize the diaspora better, I'm willing to listen to you. And I'll abandon what, what I have in mind and follow you. And then uh, they said, no, we don't have any ideas of how to do this. I said, well, I have an idea which I would like to suggest. And then when I finish, you can let me know your idea. And then I presented what I just explained to, to you during this interview. And I was surprised after several questions they asked, I answered. It did not turn into an argument. It was very polite and respectful conversation. And uh, what surprised me is, at the end of the talk, there were about 40 people there, and they all got up and gave me a standing ovation, which was not expected, and I was very pleased with that. Uh, so I, I think that went well. I had another conversation in Paris years ago. When this idea first occurred to us, Professor Dekmejan from USC and I organized a major community conference at USC about having a diaspora Armenian parliament. That's, that was in in 2010, and 800 community members came to that conference. It was an all-day conference on Saturday. We had very prominent people, Armenians and non-Armenians, come from Europe, from different parts of the United States, and speak to us about their, their ideas and suggestions. At, at the end of the day, we asked by show of hands who would be in favor and who would not be in favor of doing something like this. And I was surprised that there were almost 95% said yes, we were in favor and were willing to join. Very few people uh, said, no, it's not going to work. More recently, I, uh, there's in Lo Los Angeles, there's something called Pan-Armenian Council of uh, Western U.S., which is a coalition of 26 major Armenian organizations in Los Angeles area. So uh, I asked them to come into their monthly meeting and present the high ID and diaspora Armenian parliament concept. And they uh, graciously allowed me to do so. So I went there, I presented the uh, my ideas and uh, they listened and they asked several questions. Again, it was not a, a neither confrontation nor an argument. It was very friendly atmosphere. Uh, I answered questions and uh, at the end I just said, the reason I wanted to meet with you is because we're about to issue a press release launching our project. 
And since you are the major organizations in the community, I want you to know directly from me before you read it in the newspapers. So it's a sign of respect for you. And they appreciated that. And I said, thank you very much. And, and I left. Now, uh, since then, uh, unfortunately, nothing much happened in terms of diaspora or, or community organizations contacting us. Or We do not have a system where organizations can join us, but their members can join us. And organizations can play a positive role by urging their members to join us. But as we all know <laughs> how our organizations behave and feel, I won't be surprised and no one will be surprised if we say that uh, every organization wants to blow their own horn, push their own agenda, enlarge their own membership, and they're not about to encourage other organizations or encourage their members to join other organizations. So I'm not surprised by that. And uh, yes, uh, as you said before, you said something uh, very correctly, which I say all the time when, when asked, is this a doable idea? And uh, Some people say it's impossible. I say, well, my answer is this is not an easy thing to do. We have 7 million Armenians scattered in over 100 countries. Just to let them know, let them know that there's such an idea, forget about whether they agree or disagree, even just to let them know is a major challenge to spread the word to 7 million people. And a good chunk of them are completely out of the Armenian community. They don't speak Armenian. They have nothing to do with the Armenian community. They're scattered all over God's creation. So they, they will never know that there is such a thing. And I say something surprising to uh, some Armenians. Uh, they're shocked when I say this to them, but I believe it's true. Believe it or not, after 30 years of having a Republic of Armenia, there are some Armenians, I don't know how many, but some Armenians in the world, they haven't even heard that there is such a thing called Republic of Armenia in existence today for 30 years. So if they don't know that, they're definitely not going to know our project. But those who have something to do with organizations or the community, or they go to Armenia, they read the Armenian media, they follow Armenian news, they care about being Armenian, we want to re reach them. And I don't say it's impossible, but I uh, agree that it's very difficult because if it was easy, like you just said, it would have been done decades ago by many other people. Yeah, No one would have waited until now for us to come forward and present this idea to them. Harut, you've talked about the diaspora organizations. I think in a previous conversation a couple of weeks ago, you told us that you pitched this idea to the prime minister as well. Can you tell us here what the response and any consequences from there? Thank you for the reminder. I, I was in Armenia in uh, September 2019. And because I have years of experience uh, dealing with Armenia's top leaders, president, prime minister, the thought crossed my mind of contacting uh, Prime Minister Pashinyan and asking see if he would be amenable to meet with me. I knew it was not an easy task because uh, he and I we had never met before. So I, I was just an unknown person to him. And uh, also I, I, I thought if every diaspora Armenian visits Armenia and wants to meet with the prime minister, He's not going to do anything else but meet with uh, tourists from diaspora. But I was very surprised. Uh, I, I called and left a message for him with his secretary. And within a few minutes, secretary called back. He says, Prime Minister will be waiting for you in his office at 5 o'clock today. And you have one hour. So I was very happy. I went there. And the, the Prime Minister was very gracious. He said, we've, you and I, we've never met. But I know who you are. And I know what you've done in terms of the Lindsay Foundation in terms of the uh, humanitarian aid for Armenia through the United Armenian Fund and Armenia Artsakh Fund. And him being a, a journalist in the past, he knew about my articles and my newspaper. So he says, I, I know a lot about you, even though we've never met. So it was a very nice, uh, easygoing conversation. Most of the hour I, I did what I used to do with previous leaders, tell them all the things that I see that there's a problem within Armenia whether the laws they pass that I have something to say about or decisions they make or uh, appointments they make, I always spoke out. And uh, I feel I have an obligation as an Armenian. Is if, if I see that something can be improved in Armenia, it's our homeland, I'm going to speak up. I'm not going to say, no, I have no right to open my mouth. I, I, I give myself the right to, in order to improve things. So I spoke about a lot of these uh, issues, uh, or a lot of them. And then the last five minutes of the hour, I said, Prime Minister, I would like also to let you know about 
a project that we're working on, a group of us, and we'll be uh, issuing a press release shortly. And I don't want you to read the press release and know it directly from me. And he says, go ahead. So I explained to him what I just explained to you. And uh, surprisingly, he got very enthusiastic, excited about the idea. And I wasn't surprised that he was excited because he himself, when he has traveled in the different countries, he has mentioned uh, something very similar to what we're doing. He has said, well, if I want to know what does the diaspora think about a particular issue, who do I call? Who do I talk to? And some people say, what is the phone number of the diaspora? <laughs> Right. There are millions of phone numbers, not even one phone number. So he says, if the diaspora were, were to be organized in the one platform, it would be easier for me to find out from one phone call what they think about this. So when I said what, what we're doing, he, he welcomed it. He was very enthusiastic. And he even made some suggestions uh, to me, which was very positive. He said, where will the diaspora army and parliament meet? I said, well, the parliament will decide when they get elected. I cannot decide for them. But I said, if I were to guess, I assume they're going to meet in the major diaspora cities, Los Angeles, New York, London, Paris, Beirut, Moscow, etc. He said, no, I have a different suggestion. I said, yes, please. He said, I uh, suggest that you guys, parliament members of diaspora, come to Yerevan and we will create a an upper chamber or the Senate. Armenia only has one chamber, parliament, as you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll create a Senate and you guys will be the Senate of the Armenian parliament and represent the diaspora there, and uh, have your meetings and uh, discussions, etc. I said it's a very uh, good idea. It's an idea that I've been I've heard about in the last 30 years. Various officials have talked about it, including Arun Shagopian, the previous diaspora minister, had mentioned that. But after 30 years of talking about it, nothing was done, as in most cases, the, the things that we talk about that nothing gets done. So I said, that's a good suggestion. We'll definitely consider it. And uh, the parliament, will, when they exist, uh, they will consider it. So it was very positive. The last thing he said was, he said, since you're going to issue a press release, do you mind if you share with me the draft of the press release? So if I have anything to add, I can say it before it's uh, released worldwide. I said, of course, no problem. So I did send him the press release when I got back, when we wrote it. And this is also... Uh, we have to be very honest with each other. It's a problem that we have with Armenian leaders, not only now, but also in the past, because I've dealt with all of them for years, uh, hundreds of times. Anytime you send an email to them, you never get an answer. And you follow up, you don't get an answer. The only way to deal with them is what I've always done and what I did with Pashinyan. You go and sit in front of them if you have the opportunity, if you can get an access to them and you say whatever you want to say to them and you get an answer right away yeah. in that meeting and just writing to them or calling them or whatever or sending a mailing a letter uh, it doesn't work so no response uh, is actually an agreement Harut. i i don't know i mean i uh, we're we have a we're used to different standards when somebody sends you an email you you respond even if you agree or disagree or uh, somebody uh, sends you a letter, you respond. But um, I, I did send the letter to Prime Minister. Uh, I did get a response. Uh, to this day, I don't have a response. I uh, gave the letter to somebody who has access to the Prime Minister. He walked in and handed it to his top aide and to give it to him. That didn't help either. We didn't get a response. And then he appointed Zare Sinanian as the diaspora minister. And I know Zare from Glendale, as we all do uh, for many years. When he came here, I met with him and I told him about my discussion with the prime minister. And Zare says, well, I know nothing about this. Uh, I hear it for the first time. Prime minister is, did not talk to me about this. And uh, he said, go in and send me a copy of your press release and I'll get back to you. I said, sure. So I emailed him a copy of the letter. I also did not get an answer from him, <laughs> which was a little more surprising because he's grown up in the diaspora. He, he knows how we do things here. And then I sent him a second letter several months later. Again, no answer. Finally, out of desperation, since I, I have a newspaper and Sinanian's office, the high commissioner for diaspora, uh, sends periodic press releases to Armenian newspapers around the world. One of these days, one of those days when I got a press release from his office, 
Uh, it was sent by uh, one, one of his, uh, I guess, assistants or secretaries. So I responded to the press release saying, could you please advise Mr. Sinanian that I've been waiting for over a year for, for an answer to my emails. I would like to know what it, what he thinks. So uh, apparently it worked. Uh, the girl went and told him. And uh, a few days later, I got a reply. And uh, I was very disappointed with his reply. Because as opposed to his bosses, Pashinian's very enthusiastic welcome, he was very negative, cannot be done, this is not a good idea. And then he did not even read fully what I sent him, didn't un un at least didn't understand it. He kept saying, how will you unite the diaspora if you're only doing this in the United States? In the press release, it says we're doing this worldwide, not just the United States. So that didn't go anywhere in spite of all my efforts, neither with Sinanian nor with Pashinian. And of course, uh, as we discussed recently about the Global Armenian Summit, they call it, uh, that they organized, it would have been a very good idea to have someone like me go there and present this idea to Armenians worldwide and see their reaction. But I was not invited uh, to that summit meeting, and uh, I didn't have the chance to do that, uh, which is very unfortunate. Okay, Harut, so what is the current state of the project? How many people do you have registered from the diaspora, from the Republic? Where do you stand today? Well, uh, I would like to answer in, in two ways. One, uh, I already mentioned the Glendale chapter and the Tahanga chapter. We also have a chapter in, uh, in Yerevan, and we also have an office, High Idea office. It's the only office we have in the world. It's in Yerevan as the homeland. And we're still trying to spread the word inform people around the world. Our plan is to give a big impetus to the uh, membership drive by establishing chapters in different countries. Like yesterday, I got an email from someone from England saying, I'm very interested in high ID. How can we establish a chapter in, in England? I have similar uh, contacts in Germany, Cyprus, Greece, France, Switzerland. In Armenia, we have a chapter and we have members there. So we haven't yet really uh, been successful in establishing this network of chapters because after all i think the only way this idea is going to work and pick up speed if we have chapters in different countries even though small chapters just few people a handful of people yeah they, they live there in their own communities they know everybody there they will spread the word they will invite people to meeting they will go see them etc me sitting in glendale there's only so much i could do by giving interviews or press releases. Unfortunately, with COVID the last two years, we didn't have the chance to really travel around the world, which would be a requirement unless you have local chapters in many of these countries. So we, we have uh, not very many numbers. Uh, I would say we have roughly about 2,000, which okay. is uh, too few. And uh, hoping that when we get to a, a point where... Uh, I don't know what they call it in uh, nuclear physics, a, a point where you you get there where it really spreads. Critical mass, you mean? Critical mass, that's the word. Thank you. I'm hoping that once we establish chapters, then it will really pick up the speed. Okay, so you, you're saying there are almost 2,000 high ID card holders taking advantage of vendor discounts and things like that today? Well, we have done a little bit of work on the discount system. Uh, because uh, the discount system is a little complicated because it needs extensive software development. Mm -hmm. And we have an engineer that has done the basic uh, high ID software for us. But for the discount, it needs a lot of work and a lot of uh, money. You have to pay a, a software engineer to spend a couple of months of developing uh, because when they go shopping, the uh, shopkeeper, when he rings the amount and then enters the cardholder's number automatically through the computer, a 5% of the discount will go to the shopper and 5% mm -hmm. will automatically be forwarded to the high ID. So you need a special system for that. It's not just word of mouth or just telling somebody to agree to do it. You need to have the software to back it up and, and uh, people can join the system through that special software. Which we haven't done that. The, the only thing we've done so far, we've talked to a number of major American companies that give discount to groups. And uh, that doesn't require any special software. But what it does is, if like Amazon, if you re register us as charity with Amazon, 
when somebody shops and enters uh, Amazon Smile, then our uh, charity would get half of 1% of the amount of the, the purchase. We have done that with a number of other uh, companies. So that's not the full discount system that we're planning to have. Yeah, if, if someone wanted to get in touch with uh, Harut or the organization to lend their support or volunteer, how could they do that? Okay, the best way to for people to contact us, and I hope they do, is twofold. One is High ID has a Facebook page. Then the other one is uh, High ID has a website. It's spelled H-Y-E-I-D dot org, High ID dot org. If they go there, there's an application form they can complete, and uh, they send it to us, and and then we'll send them their uh, membership card. So I urge everyone to go to highid.org or to go to highid Facebook page, H-Y-E-I-D. And, you know, the, the last thing I want to say is that no matter how hard I work, I have a board with me that we meet every Saturday and we plan our activities. No matter how hard a, a group of us will work, we will never be able to get 7 million Armenians or, or millions of Armenians to join us. The Armenian diaspora have to have a basic understanding that this is a wonderful project, wonderful concept. And if we had such a thing already in existence, we would have made a big difference in the situation in Armenia and Artsakh now by having millions of people that uh, actively pursuing, lobbying, uh, working with Armenia and Artsakh. Unfortunately, we don't. But if Armenians in diaspora realize that if high ID and diaspora Armenian parliament had existed, it would make such a difference, then they themselves would come forward and rather than us chasing them, they would be chasing us, trying to join and make this a reality. If they don't, we will never get there. So it's up to the Armenians. Whether they, do they want to get organized? Do they want to have a clout in different countries? Because this, this is not only a, a pan-Armenian issue. It's also once Armenians in each country have their elected representative, then their own local uh, country government knows who to contact when they want to deal with the community. Right now, the, for example, the U.S. government, if they want to meet with Armenian community leaders, who do they call? They're going to call Armenian organizations. And it has happened once before when President Clinton was president and he wanted to meet with community leaders. There was big, big war in the community of who is the organization that uh, should go to uh, that meeting with the president in the White House. And uh, um, I was there, I attended, and uh, after a lot of conflict, uh, a dozen of us made it there. And uh, that's not the way to do this. If there was elections and the public elected their official representatives, there'll be no question who represents the, 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 the Armenian-American community. People will elect them, and it, nobody will dispute because there, there will not be self-appointed leaders. All right. We're going to leave it there for today. Thank you, Harut. Thanks Thank a lot for too. joining us. Thank you. Thank Wait. you. Good luck to you. Thank you. That's our show this week. We hope you found it informative. Now go find us on social media and follow us. We'll talk to you next week. <laughs>